everybody. This is Dr. Eliana Aaron, Director of EMA Care. Hope everyone's doing well. Today I'm going to talk about, today is uh, May 11th. Today I'm going to talk about um, what the issues are in terms of opening up the uh, synagogue. And, um, and in the United States, what they're doing by opening up economies while some states are still peaking in their numbers um, and what that really means. So first of all, I'm going to talk about some basic um, issues regarding the spread of the disease so that you understand how that impacts decision making on what is safe in terms of reopening the synagogue. So this goes back to the question of where do people get infected? So we're all very nervous when we have to go to the supermarket, when we have to go to the pharmacy. But the truth is that these are not terribly high risk places for the people who are visiting those places. Perhaps they're high risk for the people who work there. Because part of um, the calculation of getting this disease is actually the amount of time that you are exposed to it uh, the concentration of the viral load that's in the air where you are, and the distance you are from the person who is, you know, breathing in and out this, uh, this virus. Um, there is a connection, obviously, to fomites or con physical contact with things that have uh, the virus on it. So those are things to keep in mind. But the main sources come directly from other people. So it's estimated that you need a thousand um, particles of the virus to get infected. So what does that mean, a thousand particles? Because we don't know, we can't see them. We can only know what science has taught us about the different ways that we can get them. So depending on uh, how high the viral load is for the person who you're getting this from, they could be uh, with a higher viral load and every breath that they, they exhale is expelling a thousand particles of the virus. And it could be for someone who has a lower level of viral load, that it could be 10 breaths of 100 particles breathing towards you. So 10 breaths would be a certain number of seconds depending on the breathing. And of course, for someone who has very low um, particle emission, that could mean 100 breaths of 10 viral uh, particles. So the longer that you're with somebody in close proximity, which we're estimating at two meters, although we know that for certain kinds of breathing, um, that's much further, such as sneezing and singing and coughing, um, that's beyond the two meters. But that why the two meters makes sense, because the average breath doesn't go past that, uh, that that distance. So for example, when someone coughs, um, a cough releases about 3,000 droplets. Most of them are heavy, most of them drop right away, and then some do stay in the air. A sneeze is actually more aerosolized. A sneeze actually projects much further um, and can release as much as 30,000 droplets. So it's very important to realize that there is a difference. Both of them aren't good, but a sneeze actually goes everywhere. It just spritzes out. It travels very far. It can travel uh, 200 miles an hour. And it can travel as far as seven or eight meters away from a person, which is like 23, 25 feet. So it really does actually cover the room, um, even though you can't feel it and you can't see it. So when you look at the amount of particles that you are potentially inhaling, when someone is not practicing good cough and sneeze hygiene by coughing and sneezing into their elbow, um, then what happens is they share the joy with everybody in the vicinity. And anyone who is coming into the vicinity over the next period of time, which could be a couple of hours. To put this in perspective, that's a normal cough and that's a normal sneeze. When somebody has, um, someone who's infected coughs or sneezes, what they project out that we don't see and that we don't know is millions and millions of these viral particles. So when someone is not practicing good cough hygiene or sneeze hygiene, 
they are literally projecting millions of particles. You just need a thousand to get sick. So the chances are very high uh, that someone in the vicinity could actually catch it that way. So regular breathing in and out um, expose a lot less uh, respiratory droplets. Just, you know, when you breathe normally, there might be a little humidity. If you, uh, you now people are wearing masks, you kind of feel it's a little bit humid when you breathe, but it's nothing to the amount of a sneeze or a cough. So that means that for a normal well person who's not coughing, not sneezing, or using good cough hygiene, um, the amount of particles that are going to be in their breath is very low. But when we talk about a thousand particles, and let's say I'm only exposing 10 particles of each breath, if I work next to somebody who is uh, well and I am sick, for sure I'm going to have 100 breaths, and some of them are going to be in that person's direction over the course of the day. So the longer we have exposure to people in close proximity, the more likely it is that we're going to actually spread this to them. Uh, so when we look at a synagogue situation, that's one of the things that we need to consider, that besides the people who may not be using good cough and sneeze hygiene, uh, synagogue is usually not something that lasts only a few minutes. When we go to a grocery store, we go in, we go out, we're not really socializing, we're moving around, we're not exposed to a single person for a long period of time. When we're in a synagogue, we're sitting in a specific place and um, the purpose of being in the synagogue is to pray or to talk, uh, depending on uh, what you're doing there. But talking to God, talking to people, same air is coming out of your mouth. And actually singing is another issue, isn't it? because singing actually projects much more. And we're gonna talk about that now. So speaking increases the amount of droplets coming out of your mouth by about tenfold. Okay, so if normally you have um, 20 droplets that come out of your mouth or you know potentially particles, that would mean 200 um, of these droplets. Now, when you're with somebody in close proximity for a period of time, um, even if you're not in that much close proximity, but when you're talk, more droplets come out than when you just breathe. So, because we have to project our voice, part of projecting your voice is actually forcing, think about an accordion, forcing the air out through your vocal cords to make that um, sound project. So that actually causes increase in the amount of droplets that come out. Another thing to consider, we're, now in May, in Israel, it, there's a huge heat wave expected um, starting this week, and the air conditioning systems are going to be on. So when you think about the airflow also, that more people tend to get sick who are downwind of the sick person, and that actually can project the regular droplets that come out much, much further because it's being helped by this uh, wind or by the air conditioning system or ventilation system. So that's also a factor to consider. There was, regarding singing, there was um, an outbreak, and I got this from uh, an article that, uh, that I read recently by an epidemiologist, a legitimate one, and uh, there was an outbreak among uh, choir members in Washington State. So they were in practice for two and a half hours, they stood six feet apart, um, and they didn't share any equipment, um, and they were all very separate. But because they were together for two and a half hours, there was a large percentage of the people who were in that room. There was one infected person, and that person ended up infecting 45 of the 60 choir members in this singing session. So when we think about synagogue again, um, they're singing, there's chazanot, there's uh, somebody who is a cantor, and that person's job is to sing, and everyone answers by singing. So lots of singing going on in all directions. So even if we maintain distance, we have that problem when you're inside a room. Now, there is, obviously, there are, um, um, in Israel, they're allowing prayer outside. Uh, again, distance, and this is the reason why. I'm explaining the reason why. But once you have a lot of space, and then the ventilation is kind of everywhere, then it diffuses the droplets quite a lot. 
and it's a much safer potential environment than being indoors. Even if you're in um, an indoor enclosed area that's quite large, you can still spread this. And there have been incidences of people being together for a couple of hours and one person who is sick in that room, even if it's a very large room, um, infects a lot of people because it's a lot of time that you're together. So when you're thinking about the indoors versus the outdoors for, for davening, um, there is actually a very significant difference epidemiologically. A lot of people say, well, now we could do, in Israel, we could do 50 people can pray outside as long as they're two meters apart. But they're still outside and there's no roof and there's no air conditioner blowing. There's wind everywhere. There's air everywhere. Fresh air is a very important component to reducing transmission risk. Um, obviously, everyone wearing masks would be ideal, and it is actually the law. Um, it's not always maintained, but that would actually reduce the risk quite a lot, much more than anything else. Another issue is that once you allow the synagogues to open, it's very hard to tell people, well, synagogues of this size that give this much space per person are allowed to open, and synagogues that give less space can't open. The average person is not going to be able to figure out the square meters of a facility. Um, and a lot of the synagogues that people actually daven in are little shtibles, little um, rooms that are very crowded, um, poor ventilation. And this is how we got into trouble for in time, actually. Throughout the Jewish world, we got into trouble because people were crowded together for Megillah, they were crowded together for parties, we stayed in that room for a period of time, all of us, breathe, all of us breathing, um, singing sometimes. Um, the Chazan and the person reading from the Megillah were, um, were speaking loudly and singing, and uh, a lot of people ended up getting sick. So we can't fall into that trap again. It's very important. And once you open up this kind of synagogue, the other kind of synagogue will want to open up too, and it leads to a very big Pandora's box where we just don't know where to draw that line. And even if you draw the line, are people going to follow it and then um, get into trouble that way? So there's a lot of factors here about opening up the synagogues and um, that's why this has been delayed. So it's very logical to me that they're allowing 50 people to be together outdoors with masks six feet apart or two meters apart, um, rather than saying, let's just open the synagogues with 19 people. There's a reason for it, and I think it's a good one. Remember that the equation here is the dose of virus that you have and the exposure time. So if you think about a mathematical equation, those are the two things. So the dose depends on, well, if you wear a mask, it reduces the, uh, the dose quite a lot because all the droplets are pretty much captured in here. It reduces by about 90%. Um, and uh, the dose is also reduced with good hygiene and with distancing. So the further you are away from someone, the better off you are. And the amount of time that you're spending together. When you're in a supermarket and you pass somebody in the aisle, it's not likely unless they cough or sneeze right around the time when you're there that you're going to get something from them. Um, but if you are with somebody in the same space, even if you're six feet apart, but you're together for an hour, or two hours or more during, uh, during dominating, and you're going to end up in a situation where, um, where you're much more exposed and much more likely, even at low viral doses, to actually catch the disease. So it becomes very important to make those considerations. Now, my second topic is, I'll be brief, is about the reopening of um, the economies in the United States. So the United States um, epicenter of this disease was actually New York City. Um, it was actually New York State, but the area around New York City, including quite a lot of the suburbs. And New York is actually doing really well. Their numbers are coming down. They're really on the downslope. That doesn't mean it's over. We know that uh, the downslope is much longer than the upslope, but we do know that they're doing well. So it makes sense that New York has started slowly reopening the economy. When other states that have not peaked, some of them are at their peak, some of them are just starting to peak now. 
and they are jumping to restart the economy, what is going to end up happening most likely is that they're going to have a huge surge, okay? All the work that was done until now is going to go away. There's going to be a surge because everyone's going to come out. The problem is, and this is something that the economists don't always understand, is that if the disease is not controlled, the economy is going to pot anyway, okay? Because people are going to be sick. And, um, and people, when people start getting sick, even if there are no restrictions, people are going to be afraid to go out. They're going to be afraid to go to the store. And so what ends up happening is that the people are the ones who suffer. The death rate goes up, and there's a very heavy price to pay long term for this. So I think that some states are jumping to this to prevent riots, to prevent social unrest, and I understand that. But I also know that sometimes they're jumping to this conclusion too early and not every state is where New York is. Very few have numbers that are actually coming down. So um, I'm just um, making my two cents on this issue. I hope everyone stays healthy and, um, and please stay safe and uh, try not to go out too much.